kettles boiling in the other room. Didn't know so this is kettle that I sort of started and Jesse helped finish. This is when we joined forces. Yeah, this is the first song that we really sort of co-wrote and most of it was there really it's just like a G and a C with an A behind it. Oh, so it's a C it's when a C you move the G. Yeah, there there you go, see, you should come here and learn my songwriting class. I think class. I might enrol. And Kettle was sort of a very melodramatic version of expressing that sort of teen angst. That song struck a chord I think because the lyric was so sort of direct and simple and the chords were very simple. One thing I want to impart to you guys tonight is like don't be afraid of naivety. Some of the most successful songs in the world are very naive. Whether that means that they're just three chords or the lyrics are very direct and they don't employ a lot of metaphor. It's really about getting a feeling across and I think sometimes getting very caught up in complexity unless that's your specific bag. But as a songwriter, as a sort of traditional singer-songwriter, I think the power comes from directness and authenticity and actually using examples that are real to you. It's like this famous saying that writers have is write what you know. Definitely sing what you know and write what you know when you're writing songs as well. Why the first song was the most successful that we ever had, I think, was because it was really just coming straight from the heart and there was no real sort of... <laughs> thinking from a songwriter's perspective perhaps. I think it was very just direct. I think we were writing mm. what we were passionate about, what we thought was cool, without um, having any kind of success or even any real vision of how it was gonna sort of get released. So this is another good example of a naive song that, that works. So they tell me. Old friend of mine, we were it's written guitar first too, so that was the writing process for us for, and still is, you know, when we, when we write together and has been on and off throughout the years. So it may be that there's a chord progression that, that sort of um, jumps out and then that might sort of trigger a melody over the top. So I know that's how I've been working with a lot of you guys writing and it might be a chord progression that someone's come up with or it might be a lyrical line which I know yeah. has happened with us a few times. It often happens for me when Jess is playing around with chords, I'll instantly get the first line with the melody at the same time. You know, you just hear it all at once. It just goes, but about that. It's like, it's gotta be that word. And it's annoyingly usually only one phrase and then you have to tease the rest of it out. It doesn't arrive complete, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, verse, chorus, outro. The, just the production was, was intense on that song, like the chorus, we laid up like Millions 40 of guitars. guitars or something we had ridiculous. Sing Sing Studios like almost melting down because we were just using channel yeah. upon, upon channel. Upon. It was the 90s. It was like cool to just, ma it was very maximal, not, not a minimal time. Yeah. So it was a big fat chorus and grunge had just sort of happened as well, which really informed us, even though we were sort of Way more pop, pop songwriters. Yeah. We really loved the grunge aesthetic of quiet verse, big chorus, quiet verse, big chorus. Yeah, so that, that was definitely, ha you know, the production definitely played a big part in that song because the chorus, so the verses were acoustic like that and the choruses were just like compressed, massive drums, massive guitars, all Quadruple blaring. tracked vocals. And but I do think it's important, you still got to be able to, you know, no matter all that production, strip a song back to its bare essentials. I think it's very dangerous, dangerous to rely on production or rely like, oh, we'll just do something there, we'll do something in the studio, we'll make something happen there and then we'll get back into the verse always think what would you do at the campfire test if you can't carry it through with one voice and one guitar or one piano or whatever your instrument your weapon of choice is I think that's a songwriting problem don't rely on production make sure you can play it the whole way through sans production not every song needs a verse and a chorus and a middle eight you know, take a walk on the wild side, Lou Reed. These are just great vibes. Somebody going round on a vibe, telling a great story, or there's a hook in that. Don't write a shitty middle eight because you think you need one. Is basically my point. Yeah. You are just starting out in your songwriting career or your performing career. You're so precious. Like you're like, <gasps> do not change my song. It just felt like absolute. Hor horrendous to kind of give that over to someone and have them chop bits out of your song and stick them back on the end or turn that around and it was really challenging but I you know I can tell you like 20 years later it's okay it's okay <laughs> like you know you can always put it back the way you had it performing is the fun bit that's my main message is that you've got to enjoy performing if you you know if that's your bent you've got to just relish it and I think cutting out the noise is another big tip, like cutting out nerves and noise and what other people are going to think. It's for you, like performing. If you're loving your performance, other people will love your performance. 
but we well, I think even when you're warming up, give it 100%. Yeah. I mean, obviously, vocally, if you have to be sensitive to how much yeah. how much stamina you've got, that's one thing. But you otherwise, you? you should really be presenting yourself at your best all the time. Every time. I know it could sound Every weird, time. but you never know when... Like, I've been to sound checks sound before checks. where you're doing sound checks with other bands and there's a band up there blowing your mind at the sound check and instantly that's think oh maybe you'll come play with us next time or let, let I love that person let's write some songs together like all that stuff just happens it's not as easy as it easy as it seems I hate to say it, fake it fake it till you make it fake it because the more you just ignore the world falling down around you if you go down with it it does fall apart. I've had to do this many times. I've had to just stay up the front going, whoa, that's wrong, that's wrong, that sounds awful. Whee! Crazy feedback coming in here. But being the face of the band or being the performer that everyone's looking at, don't get, don't get, don't go That's really disengaging the crowd and that's really, I think, a sign of, you know, professionalism or even more than that, it's just like, the crowd just want to know that you're still connected to the song. Don't lose that connection to the song because that's what they're there to see. They're there to, they want to see you retelling that story. Should I keep holding on? I'm waiting for that ship to come in. Change in the wind to blow through. I hold out my hands. Nothing more I can. It's good to keep bear in mind. So, say for example, you know you, you are a rock player and you've got like a, a, a folk player, for example. You never know what those ideas may bring in the middle yeah, of something really amazing. Yeah, don't judge a book by its yeah. co-writing cover. Sometimes great gold can come out of weird combinations, and a lot of famous co-writing teams, even you know, bring really different. The things. Beatles and you know the very different personalities can create really good music together the best maybe the best music the best of the Beatles you have just a little band called the Beatles I used to get Jesse to just tape himself playing the riff if I was having trouble with lyrics you would just have to play it and play it and play it and play it play the underlying chord progression till it came but um sometimes you know that's when you've got him right there to play it, that's great. Otherwise, just make a tape, have it on in the background, and you'll eventually get the sort of the cadence and the rhythm of what's going on. I'm waiting for that ship to come in, change in the wind to blow through. I hold out my hands, nothing more. In terms of arrangement, we've definitely used, like, you know, I've spoken about this in the class as well, that, you know, there's this there's this flow of a song and a dynamic build where generally speaking you want to take people from here to here and you don't want to sort of just jolt them around so maybe it's like we want to take them from from zero to ten at the end perhaps if it was a pop song and it's like about how we're going to build there and so there might be a strategy of okay well obviously choruses pre-choruses and verses but the verses are going to continually build a little bit more so we're progressing the story throughout so that's definitely a um, technique that I feel like is really handy for most songwriters Great art is never finished, it is just abandoned. Yeah, thank you. Great. I, I think in, like when, we, when we listen back to stuff, we, always, we quite often think, oh man, I wish we could just tweak that or come back to it and redevelop it. But I guess it, we've just learnt that you know, at some point you've got a delivery or you want to get something out and it's an expression of where you were at that point in time. It's, it's like a tattoo, it's you know, it's like a tattoo. People go, but how do you know you'll love that forever? And you don't. It's just a marker of where you were at the time and that's like songs as well. Of my life.